Welcome to Just Energy Radio with your host, naturopath and medical intuitive, Dr. Reed Louise. We have learned from Einstein's theory that matter and energy are one. Physicists believe that all systems in nature have their own particular way of vibrating, from the swinging of a pendulum to the waves of the ocean to the light that brightens the sky each day. Each of these oscillates at its own unique rate. The same holds true for every thought, feeling, event, or word we speak. Each has its own frequency or rate of vibration. What many of us don't realize is when we take everything in our universe down to its simplest form, it is all just energy. Join Dr. Reed Louise on a journey through time and space where past, present, and future collide. Today, what you believe may be called into question. What we want to know is... Who made up the rules? Be brave and step outside the box. We are about to turn our world upside down and venture into the unknown. Hold on. We are departing our own beliefs and entering alternative realms. Enjoy the possibilities. Hello and welcome to Just Energy Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Louise, and thank you all for tuning into the show today. Just think, tomorrow's Valentine's Day, the big old heart day. So if you haven't gotten something for your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, you have, you know, 12 hours to, like, handle it and get something good. I know I always like getting good stuff. Anyway, we're going to have a great show today. Uh, In the first hour, we're going to be speaking with Barla Ventura about mermaids. And in the second hour, with Carl Heavy about alternative health. Um. But Just Energy Radio is brought to you by SoulHealer.com, where you can find out about all the products and services I offer. That's www.SoulHealer.com. So you might be having an issue in your relationship or a health issue or problem at work. Give me a call, send me an email, drop me a note, and we can set up a time for a private consultation. It's also brought to you by the Institute of Applied Energetics. That's www.AppliedEnergeticsInstitute.com. <clears throat> Please do go by the Just Energy Radio website and sign up for our weekly, weekly newsletter to keep you informed of who's coming up on the show. And I have to tell you, next quarter, I've been working on it, and it is going to be a awesome lineup. And the surprises just keep getting bigger and bigger for me. So I guess you'll be finding out soon. Um, also, check out our YouTube channel, Just Energy Radio on YouTube. If you check out the channel and enjoy it, please do subscribe to it. We'd love hearing from you. A couple of quick announcements of upcoming schedule items. Uh, March 21st, Weird Fest, Texas, in Glen Rose, Texas. Um, I don't know. They said it's going to be weird. Actually, it's going to be a lot of fun. I think uh, Nick Redfern and Ken Gearhart and those crypto guys are all going to be there. I'm going to be there. I think it's going to be a really great group of people. March 21st, Weird Fest, Texas, Glen Rose. Uh, April 12th, History Haunts and Legends Conference in Spooky Jefferson, Texas. And then April 13th, if you are in the Pensacola, Florida area, I will be down there speaking. Um, for information about that, it is on my website, uh, soulhealer.com, justenergyradio.com. Pick any of them. It's, you know, I, I'm pretty prolific. Prolific. And then April 26th, Tyler Paranormal Conference in Tyler, Texas. Another great event. This is my first time going there, but I heard it is a lot of fun. Um, that's all I have for right now. Oh, also, I just launched <laughs> yet another website. It is, all right, there's not a whole lot of stuff on it yet, but I'm working on it. I'm working on it. It is www.medical-intuitives, that's intuitives with an S, dot com. Medical-intuitives.com. Check it out. You can sign up for the newsletter there. Ah. But anyway, um, new site. Working on redesigning all my sites, including the Just Energy Radio site. That one's a little bit of a lot, right, a lot of work. So that's uh, going to be in the process for a while. But I'll keep you informed of what's going on. All right. So let me tell you a little bit about Varla. And we're going to find out about mermaids. Varla Ventura is the author of the book of Bizarre, Beyond Bizarre, among the mermaids and banshees, werewolves, vampires, and other creatures of the night. She's also the curator of the Wiser Magical Creature and Paranormal Parlor series of ebooks. 
when not burning the midnight oil, writing about bizarre trivia and supernatural creatures, she can also be found roaming the beaches of San Francisco, cavorting with pirates and hunting for shipwrecks. Ooh. So the author of the book we're going to be talking about today, Among the Mermaids, and her website is VarlaVentura.com. Varla Ventura. Hi, Varla. How are you? Hello. I'm doing great. How are you? I am wonderful. You know, when I saw your book, I think I saw it on Amazon. I don't know. I was just kind of surfing around. I'm like, ooh, somebody wrote a book on mermaids. <laughs> I got to get them on the show. And I'm so glad that you're here. Well, thank you for having me. It's a fun topic to talk about. So I'm happy to well, be that, here. That's what I thought. So how did you become interested in ghosts and werewolves and banshees and, and other bizarre creatures? I love it. Creatures of the night. Creatures of the night. You know, <clears throat> I have sort of always been interested in things of the paranormal persuasion. I was raised in a house um, where, uh, you know, my mother had has some psychic gifts and, um, you know, had an, was a, an, an occult student and, um, and a witch. And so there, it wasn't unusual to see, uh, you know, a, a book by Sybil Leak on the shelf next to, you know, maybe where you kept your coloring books. So I kind of grew up in an environment that um, didn't, um, you know, that, that, that didn't fear ghosts or um, freaky things. And I sort of had a, had a, a gravitated towards the, some of the the darker elements of that from a young age, you know, always kind of liking the villain in the Disney movies and things like that. And so, um, you know, it's kind of, kind of the environment I, I was raised in, um, to find these things interesting and find, find them beautiful, just sort of to look at, at things a little bit, um, maybe differently than, um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a more common way of looking at things now, but certainly, you know, 40 years ago, um, it wasn't as common, I think, for children to um, play in graveyards and things like that. <laughs> so that's kind of the the background I, I came from. It was just sort of very natural for me to, you know, see Halloween decorations on the Christmas tree and play with the Ouija board and things like that. Um, so as I grew older and, and started writing and collecting, collecting stories, I, I'd always loved the... Um, those Ripley's Believe It or Not, the shows and the, and the books. And, you know, I spent my summers reading um, sort of encyclopedias with, with facts and things. So the, the first couple of books that I, that I really wrote were the, um, I really got into were the, the Book of the Bazaar and Beyond Bazaar, which are collections of trivia. Um, and then I sort of took a turn into the, um, more into the mythological and, um, uh, folklore with Among the Mermaids and the Banshee book. Cool. So I played in a cemetery when I was a kid. Actually, we played softball in the cemetery. Yeah. And uh, yeah. well, it was the only place with grass. So that was yeah. where we went. And, you know, the headstones were the bases. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Can I you like say that, that out loud? <laughs> <laughs> You just did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> to thousands of people. Oops. Hi, everybody. Um, actually, it was a really cool cemetery because I grew up in New York, and most of the tombstones were from the late 1700s in that cemetery. So, you oh, know, there was cool. this really deep historic part to it also, but we still played top of it. Um, Anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly um, have a, a great appreciation for the sort of park-like element of the cemeteries, and I don't want to give the impression that I sleep in a coffin upside down in my own house or anything like that, but I, I, I definitely think that, um, you know, there's something very beautiful about a cemetery. No, I agree. Well, during the daytime. At night, eh. mm. Not so much. Not so. Even though I do ghost hunting, but not so much. Um, <laughs> long story. I'm just not even going to go there or touch it. Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> I got a few of those myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so mermaids. You know how old is our fascination with the concept of mermaids? 
Well, I really think our our um, it, it, it goes back to even before the the, uh, the written language. There are so many accounts in oral traditions from around the world, um, m- most island or um, uh, nations that you know certainly at least had borders on the water. In those in those parts of the country, the the mythology was was very thick with um, stories of half human, half animal creatures, of um, beautiful songs luring them into the into the sea. There's art. There's um, uh, one of the earliest stories is uh, I think it's like 500 BC, and that's that's one of the first sort of like recorded. Um, stories, which is the story of a uh, a goddess at, named Astartes, who I think she was a Syrian goddess, and she killed a man that she loved, and um, was very ashamed at having done that. She didn't do it on purpose; it was sort of an accident. So she she tried to conceal herself in uh, water, into in this lake, and actually you know, couldn't, she it was, you know, she couldn't hide in there. So she ended up turning herself into a semi-aquatic creature so that she could dive and stay under the water for longer periods of time and stay hidden. And that, and that's believed to be the origin of many mermaid myths that have um, evolved from there. So I suppose as long as, you know, we could walk on land, we have had that fascination with uh, creatures of the sea but it seems like, you know, wherever you look in mythology, there are always stories about people that live in the water or can come in and out of the water. You know, not necessarily mermaids, although I could see where they could be kind of put into that category. But, you know, even in like ancient Sumerian stuff, you know, some of their gods lived in the water. Yeah, well, that's the thing that there's a counter. There's so many counterparts to the traditional mermaid that we we think of the mermaid living in the sea. But of course, you know, there's um, there are a lot of cultures that have stories of mermaid-like creatures that live in lakes. Um, you know, there's of course sea serpents and um, water nymphs and um, selkies, which are part seal, part human. Um, so there's there's just sort of that kind of um, blend of something with maybe humanoid characteristics and um, and the you know a water element and I think you know I mean water has a has so much power and has always had so much power I mean you think for ancient peoples the the how desperately they relied on um, the sea and the rain for food and for um, uh, you know, just for so many aspects of just basic survival, we we just go and turn the tap on, and we don't always think about it. We don't ever we don't think about every single drop that comes out. But certainly, um, when you are living in an environment that relies so heavily on um, the the weather and the fates, um, it's it's very traditional to in some of, for example, in um, Aboriginal Australia. Um, that the the mermaids actually helped with the harvest and ensured that the uh, the tribes would actually uh, collect enough food and um, and have a, a healthy and prosperous year, and so it was traditional to leave offerings for them. Not unlike you know in in Irish folklore, you leave an offering for like a a brownie or some kind of like house goblin to help you with the housework or. Now, you know, or the, the way people leave offerings for various deities. I just made a note of that. That's a very interesting. I love Australia because their mythology, to me, is fairly uncorrupted. And so when I hear stories that come out of Australia that you find in other places, I always have to, like, make a little note. And just, you know, for my own research, and I'm just going to share this with you, if you didn't know, you know, a lot of the times the creatures that that I was talking about that lived in the water were always tied to fertility. And so I think it's very interesting that the Australian account said that these creatures helped them with the harvest, which would tie them to fertility. Sure. Sure. I think that's an interesting, yeah, it's a very interesting point. 
um, when I was researching this book, which is a collection of both um, mermaid myths and folklore, as well as um, sort of things about the sea you might not know, um, there's a little bit of pirate action in there. Um, but one thing that I did, um, which is something that I like to do with all of my books, is get some firsthand accounts. In, in my previous two books, I had asked for um, and included people's own paranormal experiences that they had had. I think it lends a certain um, a certain element to the book to have you know stories from people who have actually experienced these things. And so I thought, well, why not? You know, let's put. Let's put it out there. Someone's, you know, if if people have had so many UFO sightings and, um, you know, they see Bigfoot, I'm sure someone has seen a mermaid. And and, <laughs> and the truth is, I think that um, I did get, I I actually did get some firsthand accounts. And just to bring it back to um, Australia, the, the reason I brought it up is that, that one of the, my favorite things that I received were from two sisters who are Aboriginal Australian and who um, granted me the, the permission to include their, what's called their mermaid dream time myth and how, how um, mermaids exist in their, sort of the, the mythology of their people and how um, mermaids contributed to that. You know, what she was talking about almost sounds like what people report of having, you know, extraterrestrial encounters in their rooms. You know, I mean, yes. you know, if, you're, if it's in the middle of the night and there's something with glowing eyes that I don't know what it is, you know, extraterrestrial mermaid, you know, I, I would never think of a mermaid or man mm-hmm. <laughs> coming yeah. into my room well. in the middle of the night, but... It's, it was it was very surprising to me, and um, she actually included a sketch so that I had a, a visual of what um, what she saw. And she said that she's returned to that place many times and has not seen it again. And um, you know, I I just wanted to point out that I mean, she she was I don't know her personally. This was all an email correspondence, but she was a very sane person. She wasn't standing there saying, "Oh yeah, you know." I just hang out with mermaids all the time. She she was saying I had this encounter and it was paranormal and I didn't know what to make of it and and I'm glad you asked because this is what I think it was. Um, but yeah, I think that it 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 is sort of um, maybe what people thought of uh, UFO sightings. 20 or even 15 years ago, um, sort of the way that, that those things were, you know, you were thought to be uh, not a sane person if you really um, had an abduction experience or you had a, a sighting. Um, so I don't know, you know, I mean, mermaids are definitely more elusive, but for me, I think, and, and this kind of goes along with the uh, Aboriginal myth, I think it's very important for us as people to to suspend our is this real or isn't this real and sort of uh, open ourselves up to the possibility. And I think that the sea is sort of the perfect template for that because every day we find things in the ocean, we discover things in the ocean that we cannot believe existed um, or that we thought didn't exist. You know, the depictions of, of giant squid by, you know, on old maps were thought to be uh, completely mythological creatures until more recently when we actually discovered giant squid that can, in fact, pull down a small vessel. So, um, but I think it gives us something, it does something to the mind, and, and that's the beauty of folklore and um, sharing stories like this in general, is that it allows us to suspend um, our need to believe and prove, and um, I think it, it gives us something. Um, culturally, it gives us the ability to think creatively and um, open our minds to other possibilities. So... Mm-hmm. Um, that I and that's something that I sort of it, that I didn't go into writing this book about mermaids, thinking that that's where I would land. But I think ultimately, like that's that's really um, to me the power of the of the stories of the mermaids. I also think they're real. So <laughs> okay, because I was going to ask you that, but I have a question. It's like, 
mermen. And, you know, our stories of the mermen, are they supposed to be like as hot as the mermaids? Hey, you know girls what? want to know. Well, that, that's another reason I, I took up this book, because <laughs> I feel that mermaids have been misrepresented in many ways. Um, while they are often beautiful for a variety of reasons, you know, they have a diet rich in omegas, they swim a lot, they have uh, very kelp-like hair, um, you know, they have to be attractive in order to lure men in. There are actually a lot of accounts of, of mermaids and mermen that are much more hideous. And many times a mermaid upon, um, you know, close contact will uh, reveal something horrifying like giant fangs or the eyes turn black. And that's very common in many of the old stories. So there is definitely a less cheerful element um, to the, you know, a, a less little mermaid of the, um, what we think of, you know, when we, when we think, we think of Ariel. Now there's nothing wrong with Ariel. Of course, she's got, she's lovely and she has her own place, but that's certainly not the real story of the little mermaid either. You know, that's a, that's a very diluted version of what really happened, um, when the, when she came upon land and, you know, her feet were, so bloody it felt like daggers were stabbing in them with every step she took on the on the land and and that was her commitment to want to be um human and not a mermaid anymore um but i think uh so mermen just getting back to mermen yes they are usually ripped of course and very strong but often um sort sort of more hideous not not particularly attractive but let me ask you this, Rita. How many men do you know would follow a beautiful woman into the sea? And how many women do you know would follow a man into the sea? I just... They would just, be, like, not really very many. Exactly. I mean, unless they had, like, chocolate or something. Maybe, you know, they <laughs> exactly. so they'd get I think some better the, results. The mermen had to operate on brute force. And the the uh, mer women mermaids certainly did not need brute force. They just really needed a splash and a wink. Yeah, and just don't now, get into you know, just don't do a close up. <laughs> yeah, well, by then it's too late. So are are mermaids and mermen able to transform their shape? You know, like I was thinking of the Tom Hanks Daryl Hannah movie Splash, where when she wasn't in the water, she was... She looked you know, normal. She, she looked human, and then when she got in the water, her tail emerged. Are there stories like that? Yes. I mean, that, that actually is, is even the theme in, um, in uh, the Hans Christian Andersen original Little Mermaid, is that she, when she is up on dry land, looks human. Only she knows how much she's suffering, and of course, if you looked at her feet and saw that they were they were bleeding from not you know just not being used to walking on land um, so that element of it that actually reminds me a lot of the selkie legend which is which is um very uh, it comes from uh, mainly from the um, British Isles and um, right alongside many of the early um, Murrow, with Murrow sightings. And the Selkie is a woman, you, almost always, I, I've never seen a story where the Selkie is a man, but I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I've never, I've never come upon one. And a Selkie is a seal, but doesn't look, looks like a seal in the water. So it's different from a mermaid in that way. But when she comes on land, she can actually remove her seal coat and then bury it. And she can, um, she can marry a mortal man, and that's usually what she did. She can have children and have a family, and she's fine un as long as the husband never finds the seal coat. Once the husband finds the seal coat, the myth is shattered, uh, the dream is over, and she has to return to the sea. Um, so that sort of trans, um, that, yeah, that transmorphing is an, is, is an occurring theme. 
Um, more often, though, you have a mermaid who's in the water just trying to, oh, I'm trapped in this tide pool. Can you help me? You know, so that so that just trying to lure um, uh, the the prey, the men into the water. Mermaids and what also. Do they do with them? I mean, you know, have to take out the garbage, change <laughs> tire. I, I don't know. I mean, so they lure them into the water, but any idea for what? Well, you know, mermaids, sometimes I think of them, um, you know, it's been said that they cause shipwrecks, but sometimes I think that mermaids might just be sort of um, kind of kind of like helpers into the, into the other world because in a shipwreck situation, here you have all these soldiers lost at sea and there's, there's not, nothing a mermaid loves more than the soul of a dead sailor. I mean, that is just like... They're match made in match made in heaven. Um, so very often mermaids would appear at shipwrecks, and I've pondered if their role is almost like that of a psychopomp, where they might um, they might actually be helping them because otherwise their bodies are lost and their souls are adrift, and the mermaids will actually come and collect those souls and um, bring them to their you know underwater sort of. Um, uh, palace or, or home where they can sort of live their afterlife in the sea rather than being a doomed ghost wandering around, you know, with never, you know, the soul never finding a resting place. Um, so they, it could be because they just, you know, they want companionship. It could be because it's they're they sort of got a bad rap, and it's really they're they're trying to help. I think it's probably a little of both, and um, in some ways, it's almost an, an animal-like quality um, in the way you know, like Frankenstein didn't mean to crush you. You know, I in the way that, you know, they didn't really mean to hurt you. They didn't realize that that was going to happen. I think it's more likely that they know exactly what's going to happen. And um, they just, you know, set their sights on, on uh, companionship. Are there Truthfully, any... St- oh. I'm sorry, go ahead. Are there any stories... Are there any stories of mortals be going with the mermaids and then coming back to tell about it? Well, there are stories that claim that, yes. And um, one of the most famous uh, stories is by T. Crofton Croker, and, and he, he wrote a story called The Soul Cages, which is actually... Um, a story that I mean, I read that in in uh, in like a grammar school primer kind of book years ago. So it's a it's a story that um, you know has been analyzed for a variety of reasons. And the soul cages are basically these lobster pots that you know just these sort of like they look otherwise empty. That this um, Murrow, that the main character, the merman, ha- has has befriended this mortal guy, and they you know he shows him the soul cages and kind of tries to convince him to stay underwater with him. Of course, many of these stories where um, the person lives to tell, um, there's very often um, whiskey involved (laughs) and other kinds of, um, you know, other kinds of, uh, you know, maybe sleep deprivation and things like that. And and not to say that that discounts the story, but it in the stories very often it will kind of give you as the reader that element of like, wait, well, was that was that really did that really happen? And this is very common in a lot of the Irish folklore. Um, it's I'm I'm not sure if you recall the story of Harvey that um, was made into a movie by uh, starring Jimmy Stewart with the big giant white rabbit mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. sort of followed him around. So Harvey was a puka, and a puka is a, is a, a trickster fairy spirit, um, most common in Ireland. And it, it has that kind of same element to it where, oh, well, you know, the, the, you know, the uh, 
uh, I think his name was uh, Elwood, the main character in Harvey, everybody just sort of said he was, he was a laughing stock. He was the town drunk. And so nobody believed him that this rabbit was following him everywhere. And so in that way, a lot of the stories, um, you know, there's so much Irish mythology about, about mermaids and marrow and um, selkies. And, and certainly part of that is because there's so much written language about that, so that when you're out there reading things, you see those a lot. Many of the more um, uh, Aboriginal cultures don't necessarily have that. They have an oral tradition, so it's not as widely recorded. Well, you know what I'm asking, because there are a lot of stories that talk about people that go missing, but they go into the underworld, they go into these caves, blah, 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 you know, and then they might reappear and they've experienced some kind of missing time, like Rip Van Winkle is one of those kind of characters. And I was just wondering if there were kind of parallel stories, you know, of people going under the sea, hanging out with SpongeBob, you know. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are, there def- they definitely are, and, and in some ways they kind of have that same, um, I guess they're, they're a bit of an allegory for like going into this other world and seeing, um, and seeing what it would be like, and, but, but most often with, with the mermaid, I mean, they certainly do exist in that, like the soul cages is an example of one where he goes down and they kind of try and convince him to come and hang out and he comes back and you know what? He gets sober when he comes back. That's kind of the moral of that story. <laughs> so we also are talking about, you know, um, the, the written version of a story that, that may have taken many, many turns since its original, um, oral telling because, you know, um, we have all the other elements, all the other cultural elements, certainly in Ireland, you know, the Catholic Church censoring what, what story, how stories were being written down and things like that um, definitely come into play. So we have to take all of these things with the, you know, we kind of have to step back and look at them um, with a little bit of a grain of, of salt or just kind of with that sort of in mind, you know, what is the real story? What is the real moral of that story, I guess, if, if, if you wanted to look at it that way? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, you know, the more I hear uh, myths and legends and stuff like that, the more I'm coming to believe that there really is a grain of truth you know, and they're just not these moral tales anymore to them. Yes, yes. I mean, I think that there's, we, we have to uh, accept that when there are so many stories cross-culturally about a particular um, uh, beast or creature that have so many similarities, we spend a, a lot of time trying to disprove um, what has been in, you know, in a traditional sense, um, an accepted part of life for, you know, thousands of years. So, so we kind of, as humans get, you know, getting in with our microscopes and our, you know, our prods and our pokes and trying to like dissect everything may just end up concluding the thing we could have just, you know, listened to the native story and gotten the same answer, saved ourselves thousands of years of, you know, agony. <laughs> I guess it's human nature to want to wanna explore those things. But I do agree. I think that when you have so many cross-cultural accounts of um, similar experiences, and this, you know, this can, can be, you know, UFOs, ghosts, mermaids, um, banshees, all of these other uh, werewolves, all of these other creatures, um, you know, at a certain point, you've got to remember that it's the people who usually have the information. They just might not always be the ones that are able to get it out there. And that these stories we share, we share these stories to um, kind of connect in that way and um, and get that truth out there. But that's really cool. Um, you know, because, I, you know, people just discount everything, you know, I mean, ghosts in particular, they like discounting UFOs. You know, there's just so much stuff out there that people discount, um, which 
I don't know. There's so much, I'm going to say, circumstantial evidence. You know, it's so many eyewitness testimonies to these encounters that if they were put into a court of, court of law, they would have to say that it was a fact, you know, or as close to a fact as they could get short of, a, you know, the smoking gun. Oh, yeah. Like, you cannot go beyond a shadow. Like, you could not really be on a shadow of a doubt for, di- completely disproving a court of law that a mermaid doesn't exist. And one of the biggest arguments is is the the existence of uh, you know as I said earlier like creatures that are discovered every day that we didn't know existed and and there are you know there are crevasses and and canyons in the ocean that you know go deeper than we'll ever be able to imagine and I think this sometimes about Bigfoot like if I were Bigfoot I would hide from humans. I would get as far off the radar as I possibly could. And I think that, you know, if I were a mermaid, what now uh, 200 years ago, probably, um, you know, it was a different, different world. We didn't have sonar things making boops and beeps and um, exploding, you know, bombs underwater and things like that, that might have just, um, you know, hide, just to hide because no matter what you do, no matter how far you go, if you get too close to shore, someone's probably just going to try and hook you with a giant hook and hang you up in their bar. <laughs> so they become more <laughs> elusive, <laughs> probably out of self-preservation. <laughs> you know, so we're talking about mermaids and, and mermen. Hmm. Um, but do you think there are other sentient creatures uh, in addition to mermaids and mermen? Or do you think that all of these sentient creatures that are being reported kind of get lumped into that category? Um, that's a good question. I guess- I'm sorry, I have this really bad habit yeah. of asking. No, no, I'm asking good questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I feel like, uh, it, it, I mean, in, in my mind, you sort of, yes, they can all be um, put together in sort of, uh, sort of one, one lump um, in terms of, you know, maybe specifically with like cryptids and, and mythological creatures. Um I mean, I think that we don't know enough about how, you know, a dolphin really thinks or, you know, a, a I mean, we kind of, we kind of have a good sense of how a cat thinks, but we've been, we, we've had cats in our own homes for long enough. And we enough. still don't know. And we still don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a, that's definitely a, a, um, you know, that's a big question, um, I don't. I don't really know the answer. I. I think yes, yes, as a short answer. <laughs> okay. Um. So, Lorraine, babe. Um. Well, hang on. I mean, she didn't really ask a question, but she made a comment about has she talked about Siren Song yet? And so, I mean, I know that, like in. All right, I have to think about this. In the Odyssey, I think it was Odysseus, plugged his ears so he wouldn't hear the siren song and go crazy and the boat would crash. You know, but what what is that whole thing? I mean, is there, other than that one story, is that a common theme that they sing these songs to either lure you in or make you crazy? Oh, yes. That is a characteristic, and it's something that sirens and mermaids and... um, other um, other creatures share that similar ability, um, like sirens. Um, the the mermaid song is very; it can be very disorienting and very um, calming at the same time. So you can imagine that you're out at sea; it's foggy, and you hear this sort of sound that, um, you know, kind of it's so soothing and you're so tired and you just don't, you know, maybe you're, maybe you're trying to uh, navigate away from the rocks and that's, they're always on the rocks. The sirens and the mermaids in these cases are always somewhere where the ships certainly 
certainly should not go. And I actually had a story of a, a friend of mine told me recently about um, her, she, when she was young, they lived on a boat. And her mom actually had this experience one night where, you know, they kind of were in this area where there were several boats and it was really, they weren't harbored, but they, they were, you know, kind of in a cove. And it was really foggy. And it was so foggy, they were trying to just get back to the dock and no one could really move. And so people were kind of like coming out and like shouting and banging on pants and stuff to keep each other from, you know, you know, hitting because the light, it was so foggy that the lights weren't even really effective until you were too close. And she heard something and she swears that she heard a mermaid because she heard this, this song. She said it was almost like a, a, mo- a little bit like a mournful cry, but it was very beautiful and she couldn't figure out exactly where it was coming from. Now, there is a scientific, you said you have a scientific mind, there is a scientific theory about the siren sounds, and, and including um, speculation for, for the sirens from the Odyssey, and that is that it was um, the, sound of the, the sound that the water made as it hit the rocks and and the way that the cove was, it actually caused this reverberation that became this sort of um, uh, almost like a song, and 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 that's what they were actually hearing. And they knew if they got too close to it, they would they would wreck. Um, but I prefer to think that there were actually um, you know sirens there singing. And um, sometimes it's a warning. Sometimes it's just to lure you in. It's one of the ways that mermaids certainly get you, you know, get you interested. So, I mean, what's the difference between a mermaid and a siren? You know, in some in some um, cultures, they're they're interchangeable. In some of the stories, they're interchangeable. But in in like a umbrella way, um, sirens can usually have legs or appear to have more legs when they're like sitting on a, up on a rock or something like that. Whereas a mermaid, most of the time you're only going to see, you'll see the fin. And if they were to come out of water, you would see the, um, you would see, you know, more of like a, a fish like tail. Um, but there are so many different variations on that. As we talked about with like, you know, that, that story in like the little mermaid or in splash where she actually was able to transform or, um, you know, in some, in some cases, the word for siren is the same word as it is for mermaid. Um, but there, there are, you know, I think technically if you were to like Google it, you would find some, some differences. Um, but that's kind of the basic thing is that sirens aren't, aren't usually, um, seen as, uh, they're aquatic creatures, but they're not seen as like half fish the way that mermaids are. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this question is from the chat room, and you know, I thought it was just chat room banter, but it's come up again. And this is from Jim, and he was curious about <laughs> how mermaids could possibly have sex. And then there was the comment, still curious about genitalia, both sexes. Pictures are always sanitized. Yeah, well, that's true. You know, it's not it's not the first time someone's asked about mermaid sex, and um, you know, for the, the only thing I can really say to that is that I mean, mermaids aren't after sex. That's something that men, man, men are after. <laughs> that's not something that mermaids are after. Mermaids are after, you know. Um, pulling you into the sea. Now, that being said, how do they reproduce? Well, if they're, you know, magical, mythological creatures, they would just sort of, you know, I guess, regenerate. Um, in a very similar, I mean, the pictures are, are don't depict genitalia, um, and most of the stories don't include um, how they reproduce. There are stories where a mermaid has a husband, a mermaid has a family, a mermaid has children, um, you know, whether or not it's the way that a, a fish reproduces and they lay eggs or they actually give birth. I mean, I, I really don't know. Well, you know, if you think of fish, you don't see fish <laughs> genitalia flying around either. I mean, all right. 
I don't go looking for fish genitalia, but you know, when you watch Discovery Channel, they got a whale flying around. You know, it's yeah. not like you see stuff. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's just tucked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we get into some really borderline <laughs> raunchy conversations hey, on this show sometimes. Jim, Jim brought it up. <laughs> I know, Jim. I know, I post it, I go, I love you, Jim. <laughs> anyway. Um, has there been any scientific investigation, you know, like in, and I'm going to say in the last hundred years, you know, when we had more sciencey kind of stuff, um, into the phenomena of mermaids and have they uncovered anything? Well, there have been a lot of hoaxes, almost one of, you know, uh, rivaling Bigfoot in terms of the number of hoaxes. We have, um, you know, P.T. Barnum was one of the most famous with his Fiji mermaid, which was basically just this kind of monkey that he kind of sewed, like, fish scales to. I mean, it was really this kind of, like, weird taxidermy thing. Um, very recently, there have been several, um, oh, I found a mermaid on the beach kind of things, and, and it's, you know, it's clearly someone, like, went to great lengths to create this mermaid-like um, creature. So um, there's a, a lot of, um, I mean, there have been investigations into that. Um, I had one gentleman tell me this elaborate story that he, he and another man went to um, an island in the South Pacific and to investigate the existence of mermaids and um, actually discovered that the people there um, had a great connection with um, the dugongs, which are very ma basically like the manatees of the South Pacific, and that their, um, their culture had this long-standing history of... Um, you know, like being able to fish when there were, you know, like dugongs, would indicate where there was a good harvest of fish and things like that, and that 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 um, if you look at a manatee tail or a fish tail, that that actually kind of morphs into um, uh, a mermaid story, almost to uh, protect the um, kind of to to protect the the real story. So there's that was an expedition that you know a couple of um, amateur scientists went on. Um, I, I know that yeah, you, you may have caught a little bit of that, that, uh, it was called a docufiction on animal planet. Which, and actually um, there was a question about that in, uh, the chat room and I just oh, kind of okay. didn't want to go there, but, oh, okay. but you well, know, yeah. they were like, I mean, the question was, what does she think about that documentary on mermaids on animal yeah. planet? Um, well, the, the only thing I will say about it, and this just goes to your scientific investigation, I, I'm, and I'm not sure if it's just because in the in the docufiction they talk about the National Oceanic um, and Atmospheric Association, but that is a government organization that um, released an official statement that mermaids are not real, so that we all knew that the that the, that NOAA did not did not say that they actually found mermaids. And I, when I saw that, you know, and I actually saw that, that before I saw the, the documentary, I, first I laughed and then I thought, wait, why are they emphatically denying the existence of something that, you know, presumably they shouldn't have to, they shouldn't have to go there. And then I thought, oh, well, you know, little girls across the nation are just, you know, woke up this morning devastated because the government declared that, you know, mermaids aren't real I mean, news at 11, Santa Claus isn't real either. And then the last, the last thing I thought was, anytime the government emphatically denies anything, it makes me very suspicious. So that, that was kind of my after the fact of this, um, these documentaries coming out. But those documentaries actually do touch on, um, you know, they, they, it's, it's not real. Those documentaries are fake but they touch on a lot of the um, real sightings and real experiences that people have had. They just called it um, uh, docufiction. Well, the unknown docufiction, I remember watching that on TV, and I'm like writing down the names of the scientists, and the next day I am literally online 
trying to find these people to get them on the show. And, oh, you man. know, I mean, I was just like, wow. <laughs> well, it only it, said it in the very beginning. It and didn't as even somebody say very. It because we had recorded it. Well, and, and as somebody watched, very astutely pointed out, like, who watches the show from the very beginning? You're usually running around grabbing your your drink and, you know, like, oh, that's on, okay. Or, you, you know, I mean, it's you're probably not going to see it, which was actually very clever of them from a um, publicity point of view. Oh, yeah, you know, this is not real, they say at the very beginning. And, you know, but that's, that's you know, part of the, the television process, so... Anyway, yeah, but you know, even the uh, the doctor, the guy, you know, he had a website up, and then on the website it said that it was like uh, shut down by Homeland Security, and you know, so there was a whole big thing online about that that you know his webpage was shut down and blah 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 blah. But you know, I went into the, the Wayback Machine. I love the Wayback Machine. And I saw that the website really was only up for like a week, you know, a couple of weeks. So it was like, so it wasn't really shut down. There wasn't really a website in the first place. Right, right. Well, um, I mean, they, there are a couple of interesting things in there. Like they have this one scene where they kind of like see a mermaid and they say it's in Kurt Yom, um, Kurt Yom Israel. And at the time when that documentary came out, I was actually working on my book, and I had I had just learned about Kurt Yam and how they actually have a high number of mermaid sightings in the co- in the you know waters right off their coast, and the, and that town has a one million dollar prize to anyone who can bring them evidence of a mermaid. So. While the documentary is kind of like showing this thing, this town actually does exist, and it does have a high number of mermaid sightings, and it does have this um, this prize for anyone who can who can prove it. Now, the you know in the in the movie, I don't. I mean, that could have been Santa Cruz for all we know. We don't know that that's where they actually were, but um, it was just kind of as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, Kurt, yeah, know, that's the place that has the million dollar prize. You know, that's. So they, so they were, you know, they they were not totally like just grabbing things from, you know, the the ether. They they had researched a lot of the common myths and stories. So for that, and for that reason, you know, I'm glad that it it puts that idea in people's minds. And again, I just think it's it's hilarious that the government felt the need to um, deny that mermaids are real. Well. You know, but it was presented in such a way that it makes you wonder if they got bombarded with emails, you know, and yeah. phone calls, and, you know, just because of people watching and going, oh, my God, oh, my God. Yeah, but come on. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, so you told about the one report of the woman having the mermaid show up in her hotel room. I'm not even going there after Jim's whole thing. And uh, But have there been other uh, sightings in, in more recent times? Not ones that you've, you know, made a call out for. You know, but I, I just kind of, you know, in my mind, I think, you know, we're in the modern era, you know, the last, I'm going to say, 100 years, you know. Um, have there been sightings, you know, in the last hundred years? Oh, yes. Yes, there have been. Um, and I think that, you know, that town is an example of where people have seen mermaids. There's, you know, still mermaids are seen, um, off the coast of Ireland and Scotland. I'm sure that, um, actually somebody called in, I was on coast to coast one night talking about mermaids and somebody called in and told this story about the mermaid that lives in, um, this giant, uh, lake that used to be a, a volcano and it's now a lake and it was somewhere in Mexico and they grew up in Mexico and there was, there's this mermaid that people still regularly see. And I, I can't remember what they, what they called it, but it was, um, this kind of, um, uh, recurring thing in this town um they didn't call it a mermaid they had a whole other name for it but it fit the description very very um uh accurately 
Um, so yeah, I mean, there are still ongoing sightings, and and I do think that it's one of those creatures that, like I said, I think people don't necessarily come forward the way they would with uh, a ghost story. But um, I do think there are people out there that have seen something or, or felt something or heard something uh, in in the water, um, and or you know or you know the grandmother told them a story. And we we you know I I I do want to point out that I I acknowledge that you know um, a sailor many months at sea, uh, possibly scurvy riddled and dehydrated might see a manatee and think that it is a beautiful, supple woman. I mean, I think we do have to acknowledge that some of these stories come from a place of, you know, uh, a hallucinatory state. But um, at the same time, like Blackbeard, for example, was was terrified of mermaids and um, actually would uh, order his crew to to um, navigate away from areas where there were reported mermaid sightings. So, you know, there's a lot of, it's kind of one of those things that's like people, you know, they, they may not admit that, yes, I totally believe in a mermaid, but if, you know, you thought that you might get sucked under by one and you were walking somewhere, you had your, you know, kid with you or something, you might, like, just to be safe, kind of keep an eye out. Well, on that note, Verla, I have to let you know, we are out of time. This hour went so fast. It did. It did. So if people want to get your book, um, well, you have Among the Mermaids. Um, all, right, all right. We need to wrap. So quick. Yeah. <laughs> com. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. And actually, <laughs> if you guys want any of her books, if you go to the Just Energy Radio site and click on her name, I have them posted with links that you can go like right to Amazon and get them and all that good stuff. Barla, yeah. thank you. Thank you You're so fun. much. It was a pleasure. Fun. What a pleasure. <laughs> okay. You have a great all right. night. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's Barla Ventura. Her book is, this one that we're talking about is Among the Mermaids, Facts, Myths, and Enchantments from the Sirens of the Sea. Her webpage is barlaventura.com. And we'll be back with Carl Helvey after these words from our sponsors. Just Energy Radio with your host, Dr. Rita Louise, will return right after these messages. <laughs> 